All right. Well, I think this puts us about at time. So uh, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Aaron, and I am an introvert. Probably not much of a surprise for a talk like this. Um, but like the vast majority of introverts, I have always been an introvert. I, I was born an introvert. I, I grew up as an introvert, and I struggled a lot as an introvert, and now I feel like I thrive as an introvert. Um, that path from struggling to thriving was, for me, very long and very difficult. Um, looking back on it, it didn't need to be. Um, I made it much more difficult on myself than it should have been, um, which is why I like to try to share some of my story and hopefully talk about the things that I did terribly wrong um, so that everybody else can uh, kind of learn from my mistakes. Um, I really started to struggle as an introvert as a young adult. Um, as a kid, being an introvert really wasn't a big deal, um, at least not for me. There were some things that other kids liked that I maybe didn't understand why they liked. Uh, big boisterous birthday parties that they were all excited to go to, and I was like, really? Why? Um, and I got labeled as being a little shy, which, as it turns out, uh, is not true. I'm not shy, but I am introverted. Those are, those are different things. Um, but even with the inaccurate label, um, it just it wasn't especially difficult for me as a kid. I know everybody's story differs. Um, but for me, I, I didn't mind being labeled as a little shy. Um, but as I became a young adult around the age of 18, I did start to struggle, and that was when I started my business. I was doing web development. I'm sure no one's surprised there either. Um, and I was, I was kind of lucky going into it. My parents had owned successful businesses all as I was growing up. So I went into it knowing and understanding that there was a lot more to running a successful business than just being good at web development. I knew that I was going to have to learn all kinds of things about business finances and taxes and eventually employment codes. And I was going to have to learn how to market. Um, and I was going to need to go out and bring in customers, clients, right? From the very start, I knew that I was going to have to do that. I had seen my parents, my dad especially, doing that um, for their businesses. Um, and, and I thought, <clears throat> no problem. Like I, I, know, I know what I'm getting myself into. Um, and so as I started my business, I started like most people do, going out to friends, existing connections, and getting them to make connections. And then I started to spread out and, and try to find clients at you know, local small business association meetings and um, chamber of commerce type stuff, small tech events near me to, to um, build relationships with other people in my industry. Um, and I was being successful, I guess. I was making it. I was paying my bills. My company was surviving even growing a little bit, but it was really hard, like a lot harder than I had expected it to be, a lot harder than my dad had made it look, and he was kind of my example going into this. Um, but I chalked it up just to inexperience. Right? My dad had been doing this for many, many years. Uh, I was brand new to it. That was, that was all it is. I was sure of it um, because my dad and I are a lot alike. We, we approach a lot of problems the same. We, we collect information and, and assess things, and um, we don't let you know emotional issues get in our way as much. Like it's just kind. Of, I thought that we were very similar. As it turns out, there's one big difference. He's an extrovert and I'm an introvert. I just didn't know that at the time. I just thought I was inexperienced. So I kept pushing ahead and growing my business. And the further I got into it, 
the more of my time and energy was being spent um, doing this one thing that was especially difficult for me, going out interacting with bigger groups of people to um, sort of build my client base. It, it sucked up so much of my energy that after a few years, I began to wonder if this like, wasn't just inexperience and um, if maybe I was just terrible at all of this. Uh, but by now I built a little bit of a network and I saw other business owners in my field um, that were going to the same, say, tech conferences that I was and made it look easy. They would go and at the end of a conference I would come away with with a few really great connections, relationships that I was going to build that were going to help me, um, but I would be exhausted, drained. They would be all energized and excited and happy, um, and it looked, from my perspective, like they had made way more connections than me. Um, and so I decided that what I needed was more information. I needed to know their secret. Um, so I sat down with several of them and I asked them, what is your secret? Is there a secret? Because it doesn't seem to just be an experience because even after several years, I'm not really getting it. So what is the secret? And every single one of them, not just one or two, every single one of them said, absolutely, Aaron, there is a secret. You just need to become an extrovert. <laughs> Yeah. And this was really where I made my first biggest mistake, which uh, caused this process from struggling to thriving to be so much longer and more difficult. Because at first, I sort of sighed and went, I don't know if I want to be an extrovert. Um, but I did want to be successful in business. And... Um, I've done other things to help make my business successful. You know, I had struggled my way through learning taxes and these kinds of things that weren't super fun either. Um, so why not this? If that's what it takes, I guess I just need to become an extrovert. Uh, and I should not have listened to them. The way to become a successful introvert is not to become an extrovert. Um, but I was young. I was inexperienced. I didn't understand um, so I went for it. I started to actively work at becoming an extrovert. Um, I would watch what they did at these events. I would see how they act. I would try to do the same. Um, and at first, maybe for a very short period of time, I thought that I was kind of getting the hang of it, mostly because I got um, good at imitating an extrovert. But... After a while, not just like a month or two of this, but after a, a couple years of this, at, at this time, I thought, hey, it's still taking a lot of energy, but at least there's a light at the end of the tunnel, right? Somehow, I, I'm still having to sink tons of energy into trying to be an extrovert, but at some point, I'm going to become an extrovert, and then magic, and it's all going to be easier, right? That, that's what I thought. I, this was the light at the end of the tunnel for me. Um, but even after a couple years of this, I was still sinking so much energy into this one part of my business. Um, the, the rest was going really well. This one part was such a struggle. And I didn't seem to be able to become an extrovert. I, I had thought towards the beginning that maybe it would be like, um, like when I learned to drink coffee. Uh, when I was young, I loved the smell of coffee, but I tasted it and it was nasty. It was, it was bitter and gross, did not like it at all. Um, but for reasons that I, that I won't get into now, but you can find me later and ask the story, at, at about age 16, I decided that I needed to drink coffee. And so I drank coffee consistently and regularly, even though I didn't like it at first. But after a relatively short period of time, it was not bad, and then it was... Good. And now I actually very much like coffee. And that just changed for me. And I thought maybe introvert to extrovert would be the same kind of change. It would be a, a struggle, but then it would get easier, and then, boom, I would be an extrovert. 
But because it wasn't working, I thought, again, that maybe what I needed was more information. I'm a bit of an information addict, if you can't tell. Um, I often think that more information will help me solve the thing. Um, so I dug in. I thought, instead of seeing what, in, what extroverts do, how they act, maybe I can figure out why they're like that. Maybe I can figure out why they do the things they do. Maybe that will help me. And as I begin, began to dig into this, um, to try to research it, there wasn't quite as much information back then as there was as there is now. Um, but as I started to learn, I quickly discovered that I couldn't just become an extrovert. Like, that's not a thing that can happen. Um, and I may have given up and just gotten so frustrated um, that this was a problem that I wasn't going to be able to solve, except that the reason I couldn't just become an extrovert was because of science. And while I was maybe a little upset that I couldn't become an extrovert because that light at the end of the tunnel was gone now, I do love me some science. And so I wanted to know more. Um, and as it turns out, digging into the science behind it, starting to understand um, the actual differences between introverts and extroverts became a turning point for me. And it comes down to our brains. Introvert and extrovert brains are different. Physically, measurably, observably different. Not just, not just like a preference, like some people don't like the taste of coffee, but I could learn to like the taste of coffee. Um, our brains process certain chemicals differently. The blood flow in our brains flows differently at different times and for different reasons. These are things that I couldn't control. Um, so I couldn't just change and become an extrovert, which was a, a little frustrating at first, but I, I started to learn how the brain did work. And basically, everyone's brain has like this peak efficiency zone. And when your brain is in that zone, it's really easy to be productive. You can get an awful lot done. You can, you can reason through a lot of things and solve a lot of problems for relatively low energy input. It takes almost nothing. You almost feel energized when your brain is functioning at this peak efficiency. And I realized that for me, I had always known that this existed, I just didn't know the specifics behind it, and I would say that you know I was in the zone. I, when I was working on writing a bunch of code and solving some sort of big complex issue, you know, I would get in the zone and all of a sudden there'd be hundreds of lines of code, um, and that was because my brain was at this peak efficiency level. And everybody has that, but it's not in the same place for everybody. And for introverts and extroverts, it can be dramatically different. And so for me, a lot of times this happens when I have very little stimulus. I'm maybe by myself sitting at my computer working on a thing. For some people, this may you, you may be at this point when you're out with friends, talking and hanging out, bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, inspiration is striking and, and you're solving all your problems and coming up with everything that you need to move forward in business or whatever it is that you're trying to, to work on. Um, and it's easy. All of that is coming very easy to you at that moment. And that's because your brain, it's at this peak efficiency. But this peak efficiency sits on kind of a continuum from... Um, less stimulated or even under-stimulated all the way up to lots of stimulation over-stimulated. And this continuum is mostly controlled in our brains by two chemicals. Dopamine on the, the, the um, stimulated side, which most of us have probably heard of, and acetylcholine. Has anybody ever even heard of acetylcholine? Okay. And yet, Almost all of you identified as introverts, and, and whether you know it or not, as an introvert, you probably love acetylcholine. Your peak efficiency level in your brain, um, when you are at that in that zone, it is likely that acetylcholine is the main dominant neurotransmitter in your brain at that time. Um, 
acetylcholine is associated with sort of focus and attention um, and, and often the, the pleasure that's derived from focusing in on a thing and relaxing. Um, and it's stored up in a couple places, the basal nucleus and the lateral dorso tegmental nucleus, which I'm just going to pretend I said right. Um, and it travels all through our brain. It's a neurotransmitter. It helps our brain do all kinds of things. Um, and it, the best, I guess, simplest way to explain it, it's like the default neurotransmitter. It's how you think when some other neurotransmitter isn't barging in and taking over and doing other things. <clears throat> Speaking of barging in, that's where dopamine comes in. <clears throat> this is the other end of that scale. Right? Um, and dopamine is tied directly with the reward system in our brain. And this is... This is interesting because a lot of people think that the reward system means something good happens, your brain sort of rewards you, but really the part of the reward system that dopamine is part of is not telling you that something rewarding has happened, it's warning you of the potential of reward, it's saying something good could happen. So you sit down at a table full of, of food that looks and smells great, your ventral tegmental area, your VTA, creates a little dopamine and sends it out because it says, this could be rewarding. We like food. This could be good. Um, it doesn't assess risk at all. That, that function belongs to a different part of the brain. Um, so similarly, if you are at a roulette table and you put it all on red, um, your VTA creates a little dopamine because it says this could be good. We like money. Now, the, it's just as likely or more likely, I guess, that you could lose that money, but this part of your brain doesn't care about that. That's another part's job. Um, but for introverts and extroverts, one of the real important things to realize here is that there is potential reward from interacting with people. When you talk and interact with a person, there is the potential for reward. Something good could happen. That could be an important relationship or, I don't know, that person could randomly pull out a $100 bill and give it to you, right? I, I, I don't know exactly what, the, what this part of the brain thinks the reward could be, um, but there is the potential and so dopamine is created. And the more people that you are interacting with, the more potential for reward. And so the more dopamine that is created. And in introverts and extroverts, the VTA acts basically the same and creates roughly the same amount of dopamine, um, which sometimes feels like a struggle because as it turns out, as that travels through the mesolimbic dopamine pathway and gets used up by the nucleus accumbens, our nucleus accumbens in introverts is really different from the nucleus accumbens in extroverts. In introverts, it is extremely sensitive to dopamine. And in extroverts, not hardly at all, comparatively. Um, so it, we've all seen brain scans that have lit up areas, right? The brighter it is, the more activity is happening in that part of the brain. These are usually EEG or fMRI scans and someone's talking about what what some part of the brain does and why it's so interesting that it's lit up bright. Well, scientists use that those scans to see which parts of the brain are active and thinking and, and in use. And when they do one of those scans on an introvert and they have measured that the, the dopamine traveling from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens is some set amount, some small amount, they will see that it lights up all over the place. But when they do the same scan on an extrovert with the same amount of dopamine flow, not near so much. But as they increase the dopamine flow, that extrovert's brain will eventually light up just like the introvert's brain. It's not that they don't have that peak efficiency level. It's not that we don't have it, but it's very different. And I started to realize that this was true about me, that, that I got 
overwhelmed easy by being around a lot of people. Um, and it made it harder to think clearly. It made it harder, not impossible, which we'll get to in just a second, but harder. Uh, on that, on that um, like under-stimulated to over-stimulated scale, when you're under-stimulated, you probably feel maybe tired, even though you've slept. Um, you probably mostly feel like you lack motivation. It's not that you can't get stuff done, but you kind of have to force yourself, push yourself, make yourself be motivated to do a thing. Um, on a day when I realize that I've been um, sort of understimulated, at the end of the day, I may look back and see a few things that I accomplished, but I felt like it was just hard to get them done and that I, I sank way more effort into doing them than I really um, should have had to. Um, but similarly, when you're, when you're overstimulated, too much dopamine, especially for us introverts that are very sensitive to it, um, everything takes a little bit more energy as well. A lot of times here you feel a little scatterbrained, like there's a million ideas and solutions flying through your brain, but grabbing onto one of them long enough to do something with it um, is hard. It's not that you lack motivation, but maybe focus. Um, it's hard to focus in on one Thing. Um, for me, it's really hard to focus in on something when there's a lot of people around. Um, and it's, again, not that I can't make myself be productive and get stuff done, but it takes more energy, more effort to do that. And a lot of this comes down to blood flow, which is also controlled by these two chemicals. Um, in an extrovert... Uh, with very low dopamine levels, this is how the blood will travel through their brain. Scientists do this by laying a person on a table that, that has one of these brain scanning machines, injecting a little radioactive isotope, which flows through and lets them follow the blood flow path. And, um, and they do this when, when someone's very relaxed, calm, Dopamine levels are down, acetylcholine is, is taking over, and these parts of the brain control um, sense, like taste, touch, etc., as well as the parts of our body that must always function, lungs and heart and those kinds of things. In an introvert, when they do the same check at the same levels of dopamine, the blood flows like this, all the way out to the frontal cortex of the brain. Now the blood is flowing through areas that control empathy, self-reflection, memory, planning, and especially rational thought, our ability to solve problems and get things done. And to get the blood to flow like this in an extrovert, all they have to do is increase those dopamine levels, add more stimulus, and the extrovert brain will get to this exact same point. But for me, when I get extra stimulus, my blood starts flowing all over the place and it gets much more difficult to focus in. This is what the blood flow looks like when you are in or near that peak efficiency zone. And once I had sort of learned all this, which may be more science than you thought you were gonna get when you came here today, um, but things dramatically changed for me. G.I. Joe really had it right. Uh, for me, knowing was half the battle. Um, and I changed my focus. Instead of the light at the end of the tunnel being, be, you know, turning into an extrovert, um, I stopped trying to be an extrovert. I stopped trying to succeed by using someone else's set of strengths. And I started to say, okay, I want to be a successful introvert instead. Step one, is that possible? Absolutely. There's a lot of successful introverts out there. Uh, in our field alone, people that helped start Microsoft and Google and Facebook and Apple, introverts. Not introverts that turned into extroverts to be successful, but successful introverts. Um, other people at the top of their field, 
historical figures that we look up to, Isaac Newton, one of my personally favorite scientists, and Dr. Seuss. Who doesn't want to be as cool as Dr. Seuss, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, so I started to think about how it is that I get there because honestly I've been thinking about it all wrong up to this point. I thought that um, the, the way to get to, uh, to get this part of my life, of my business under control was simply to basically change and become a different person. Um, and so what now? I sat down and I thought, well, if extroverts have some advantages because of where that peak zone in their brain sits on that scale of understimulated to overstimulated. What about me? What are, what are my advantages? What are my strengths? Rather than looking for their strengths and how I could use them, what are my strengths? And everyone here should be asking yourself this question. What are my strengths? Make a list. I sat down and made a list of what my strengths were. Because I knew that I would need to leverage those if I was going to succeed. And I've, I've sort of modified my original list and, and simplified it down to focus in on introvert strengths. Strengths that, that seem to be common amongst most, if not all, introverts. Um, because not all my strengths are because I'm an introvert. And I think that that's important for everyone to remember and understand. You have a specific set of strengths. And if, if you're an introvert, you probably have many of these that I'm about to talk about, as well as others, other things that you are particularly good at. So make your own personal list. Don't just use mine. The first thing that I realized is that uh, I was particularly content being alone, um, which is exactly why the extroverts had told me that I would never succeed in business. Um, but as it turned out, this can be a real strength. For me in, in web development, which I'm sure is relatively related to what some of you do, um, there were a lot of projects that involved very complex things that needed to be solved. It took focus over a long period of time to solve them, and I loved doing that. Not, not I could do that. I loved doing that. I enjoyed it. That kept my brain in that peak zone that I didn't even realize existed originally. I just knew that I enjoyed focusing in on a thing and sort of ignoring everything else around me for a while. Um, and, and I would feel energized doing that. Extroverts can focus in alone for a long period of time, but they're understimulated when they're doing that, so it takes them a lot more energy to be productive when they're like that. And for me, that was like right in my sweet spot. It was perfect. And so I started to change my business. Not just assess my strengths and make a list, but change to leverage those. I stopped going after the small businesses that were you know, local and around me and having lots of clients. And I focused in on trying to get bigger longer, more complex projects because it fit my skill set better. And as I did, I began to be a little bit more successful and also a little bit happier. It's a little harder to quantify, but as it turns out, when you're constantly running your energy reserves down to zero, I don't know about you, but for me, it made a very grumpy errand. I, I was I, I, maybe even a little cynical. Every time I would go to go out to some event, it would be very much, oh, I can't believe I have to do this again. This is going to be terrible. I'm going to hate this. But that's not how I am anymore now that I'm not running my energy reserves down to zero all the time. Um, I started to be happier. Uh, my list didn't stop there. One thing wouldn't make a very good list. So uh, I also realized that a lot of introverts, myself included, tend to be good listeners. Um, looking back all the way to when I was younger, this, this applied 
um, even though back then I didn't understand what, why it was happening. Um, but I just tended to prefer to listen over speak. Um, I was the kid that may have had most of the answers in class but wasn't going to raise my hand unless no one else was. Um, and looking back now, I can see that life is full of things that cause stimulation. Our VTA creates way more dopamine than I wish it did um, for way too many reasons. There are, there are a lot of potentially rewarding things out there. Um, and so it just seems to go crazy all the time. So I think that as a kid, I latched onto these few things that were a little bit more in my control. And I didn't even realize it at the time, but I just felt better when I was listening rather than talking. Because when you're speaking with other people, the potential for reward spikes and your VTA creates more dopamine than when you're just sitting around listening, more observing. And so I was just kind of reducing that a little bit because it felt better and so naturally, many introverts are good listeners just because they like it. They like to, they like to listen. They like to observe. Um, for me, trying to focus again on how this helped me succeed in business, as I moved to these bigger projects and ultimately all the way up into enterprise-level projects working with um, big Fortune 500 companies and such, um, this served me really well on you know, those big meetings or conference calls that had a dozen people that all had ideas and input and stuff that needed to happen. And I was very good at just listening and processing it all and making sure none of that was missed. We also tend to be pretty well prepared. Um, this is another sort of uh, mitigation thing. We, by preparing ahead of time, we can help limit the amount of stimulation that's caused by some event, something. By preparing for the meeting, um, a lot of those unknowns that cause uh, excess stimulation, those are knowns instead. And so it's, it's a little bit more relaxed. We tend to often even over-prepare, um, but we're very good at preparing for things. Um, for talks, I obviously do a pretty decent bit of research, like it's a it's a thing. I, I like to be prepared, um, and obviously this can be extremely useful in business. And we tend to be calmer. And this is um, sometimes I get the extroverts in the room that just huff at me when I say this, um, like they can't be calm. Anyone can be calm. That's not it, but. Introverts tend to naturally be calmer because they prefer it. That is on that scale of, of um, sort of overstimulated to under, we prefer to be very low on that scale, very low amounts of stimulation. And as that scale goes up, as people get more and more stimulated, that same chemical dopamine, once you hit a certain level of of stimulation, its job is to then trigger the adrenal glands. And, and that's actually when you hit fight or flight mode. You get, your heart starts beating faster, your, your, your blood pumps all to your limbs because you're supposed to run away or fight, right? This is part of how our bodies work. But literally this same scale is what we would call the calm to sort of overly excited scale, and we prefer to be down in the calmer area, especially the more that I have been purposeful about watching for where that peak zone is for me personally and trying to stay in it, the more calm I am, because for me, it's way down at the bottom of that scale. This has been fantastic for me over the last year and some change. Um, as I have led the WordPress security team, which, by the way, I'm not a Drupal person, I'm a WordPress person, um, <laughs> but um, as I've led the WordPress security team, when issues come in, when there turns out to be some sort of security thing that we need to deal with, that's stressful. Everyone slides up that scale a little bit. Um, and many of them start screaming things like, oh no, the world is burning, right? 
That's what it feels like sometimes. But for me, because I'm so low on that scale, even though, uh, yes, it does cause stimulation in my brain, it does cause me to slide up that scale, I'm still lower than most people. And, and I tend to be the person sitting there going, well, I do see the fire. Um, it looks a little bigger over here than over there, so maybe we should focus our attention there. Um, maybe we can approach it from that side, right? Um, this has been especially good for doing that. I have found a, a place that fits me very well and that this is extremely useful in. Um, and for a lot of people, this is the same, like this is the same kind of thing that's useful in um, contentious meetings and things where um, lots of people are worried or upset about a thing and the calmer you are, the more you can keep your brain in that peak zone, um, the better you're able to simply rationally think through it and come up with solutions. And the last big skill that um, that I eventually added to my list later was strong written communication. Um, I knew that I had this before I even knew really what an introvert was. Like from the very beginning of starting my business, I realized that I was good at written communication. It served me pretty well. But I didn't associate it even after learning a lot of this with being an introvert until I started doing some talks like this and talking to a lot of other introverts and hearing their stories too. And then reflecting back on sort of my path and looking at why I was good at written communication. And as it turns out, the reason why I'm good at written communication is because I practiced it a lot. I mean, that doesn't seem uh, like a revelation, but you know, it really was that simple. But the reason I practiced it a lot is because I preferred to communicate in a written form rather than go talk to a group of people. It was another one of those things that I was able to, before I understood this whole scale and how it all worked, I was able to control this one little bit of excess stimulation that I didn't really need. And it just felt better to write to a group or write about a thing or write down an explanation rather than give it in person. I didn't understand why, but it did. And now I look back and I realize that helped me become a strong written communicator. And obviously in business, whether com communicating with um, customers and clients or employees or managers or bosses or whatever, um, written communication is super helpful. And it's not that extroverts can't be great writers. They absolutely can. They can practice it just like I practiced it. But I did it naturally without even realizing it because that's just what I preferred. And so as I've talked to lots of introverts all over the country, I've realized that many of them have done the same. But even with all this, and even with adjusting my business quite a bit, um, I still hadn't come back and solved that first original thing that started me down this path. My business was growing faster now. Um, I, was, I was definitely feeling more successful and a little bit happier. But it didn't negate the fact that I still needed to be going out and bringing in clients. I still needed to be going to tech conferences both to learn things and um, to, to speak at some of them at this point to, to sort of show that I was an expert in various areas. And I, I also realized as I started kind of coming back around to this original problem that I liked doing some of that, especially now that I was just a little less grumpy because I wasn't trying to be an extrovert. Um, I wasn't antisocial. <laughs> For a while there, I actually thought maybe I'm just antisocial, which everybody tends to link up with introverts. Introverts are antisocial. But that's not true. I enjoy meeting people. I like talking to people. I like um, building new relationships and learning new things from people. 
maybe that's the information addict side of me, but like I, I love that. I love learning the new things that come from meeting all kinds of new people. Um, but socializing takes energy. I'm not antisocial. I'm not Oscar the Grouch. I'm not saying scram, get away from me, leave me alone, people. If I was doing that, I wouldn't be up here talking to you all. Um, but socializing does take energy for me. It takes more energy for me than it does for an extrovert. But that's okay. I'm all right with that. Because as it turns out, I'm willing to invest that energy into a thing that I want to do, into a thing that I consider beneficial. We all make energy exchanges for things that we want all the time. I mean, heck, some people run marathons, and that takes a massive amount of energy, but they enjoy it, or they feel accomplished when they do it. To them, it's worth it. I really love coffee, and after this... I'm probably going to walk down to the Frothy Monkey, which is like a half mile away, and get a coffee. And that's going to take energy to do, but I think it's worth it. That reward to me is worth it. Meeting people, building relationships, to me, that's worth it. I want to do that. I'm willing to spend the energy, but now I spend it purposefully. I don't pretend like it doesn't cost me energy, which is what I tried to do when I was pretending to be an extrovert. Um, Because when you do that, your tank runs empty. You spend all your energy right away and you bottom out, and that does not feel good, and it is not easy to recover from. And if you're anything like me, it makes you grumpy. Um, Instead, I just allow myself that it costs energy, and I take breaks and do things like that. Simple things. I will disappear from this conference for half an hour just to go either be in an area where no one else is, let my dopamine levels drop, let my energy levels come back, and then I'll come back and talk to people again, and I'll be able to be productive again. I'll be able to communicate better and clearer. I'll feel more energized and ready to do all that, because I've, I've given myself that allowance. The fact that not everybody needs that allowance just doesn't bother me anymore. I don't, I don't need to be an extrovert. I can succeed at these things as an introvert. Mostly what I want to sort of help everyone understand or push out there to everyone, including the extroverts, is that introversion is not a weakness. That's the biggest thing that that set me down that path that made it take me like eight years to to struggle through this and figure it out. Uh, And I thought introversion was a weakness, and I thought that because I was told that, but they were wrong. Introversion isn't a weakness. It's just a really different set of strengths. It's it's a brain that functions differently. It's not that my brain is broke. It's not that my brain doesn't work right. It's that it's different than an extrovert's brain, and that's okay. Because even with so many introverts in here, none of our brains are identical. And that's all right. We can all succeed in our own way by making our own list of strengths and leveraging those. I'm Aaron Campbell. I said that I lead the WordPress security team, so now you all can ask me about that too, I suppose. I'm funded by GoDaddy to work full time on the WordPress open source project. Um, Link to my slides is up here, but I have also tweeted it out, so it might be easier to find it at, at Aaron Campbell on Twitter. But I would love to take some questions, which I believe I have plenty of time for. Thank you. Yeah. I can repeat the question if they don't want to come up to the mic. The question is about the fact that the interns like to be in their own bubbles of work. Should it mean that employers should keep them in offices? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's... um. 
It's interesting as a person that, that leads a team that includes both introverts and extroverts, I definitely feel like um, they kind of have to be managed a little bit differently. I don't know how you draw that line on, on giving people an office just because they're an introvert or whatever. Um, but I do think that there are some advantages there, right? I do think that introverts would be generally more productive given a space where they can sort of be away from people um, for periods of time. But the biggest thing that I think most employers or managers or whatever can do is to simply start by learning whether the people that work for you are introverts or extroverts and then trying to work with them accordingly, right? If, if an introvert does need to function with a team to accomplish a task, make sure that there's time allotted for breaks that they can go away. Not we work the first half of the day together and then we go out to lunch together and then we come back and work the second half of the day together because a lunch together is not a recharge for an introvert. And if you know that you have introverts working for you, understanding that and making those allowances um, can be huge and can definitely be a boost to productivity as well. You mentioned you do a lot of research when you're trying to find something out. I was wondering if during your research you uh, came across anything about introversion and the autism spectrum? Yeah, that is, so that's a, a super um, popular topic right now, actually. Um, I definitely think that the way the research is that it looks like there's some overlap, some potential correlation. I know that I do fall on that spectrum as well as being an introvert, so uh, I also know that I'm possibly a little biased there. Um, but I, I haven't seen anything sort of concrete proof studies that, that show that that's absolutely the fact yet. But it does seem to be a thing that a lot of people are looking into and think is a possibility. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, quite a few popular personality profile tests. Do you find um, one pegs uh, certain personalities better than others? So the question was that there are uh, personality profile tests, quite a few of them, and, and do I think that one sort of is more accurate than others? And this is a this is a tough one for me to answer because I really dislike all of them. Um, <laughs> and part of it is because... I, like I'm a, I'm an extremely factual, very sort of black and white kind of person around a lot of things for me and my personality. And when it comes to one of the questions where one of the answers isn't absolutely exactly right for me, I don't want to pick the one that's closest. It drives me crazy. Um, and so I, I tend to just not like any of them because I don't like taking them. Um, but no, I, I, like, I don't have one that I particularly think is more effective than the rest. Okay. Question, uh, you talked about taking some kind of break to basically bring yourself back to a state of calm. Mm -hmm. um, either in your research or in your personal experience, do you have techniques that help you get back to that state faster? You know, is it like don't look at your phone or breathe, you know, do a breathing exercise or, you know, close your eyes in a quiet space? Is there something either worked well for you or you think would work well for more people? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. And um, for me, staying away from my phone definitely helps me recover faster because um, my phone has, for example, all the WordPress security alerts and conversations going on it. It has... Uh, you know, alerts that come in from, from GoDaddy stuff. It, it's um, all these little stimulations that make me, uh, that, that have the potential for causing a little bit of stress, which slows down that recovery time, slows down the, the ability of your brain to process out that dopamine and, and move on. Um, so avoiding anything that can be um, added stimulation like that um, and I, closing my eyes drives me crazy. That, that doesn't help. Um, deep breathing definitely helps. 
and that's a, a flat out medical scientific thing. The more you're breathing, the more oxygenated that blood is, the better it flows, the quicker you're able to process away that dopamine. Yeah. Um, so I, I have the uh, good fortune as an introvert of uh, working from home, uh, which too. reduces stimulus. But uh, I was wondering if you had any advice for anybody in the room who maybe uh, is in a situation where they don't have quite as much control over their work environment and needs to find ways to either have that conversation with their manager or just like sneak those ways to reduce stimulus throughout the day to make that happen. Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. I, I actually get that question quite a bit, and I don't work in an office. I, I work from home as well, so um, I I don't feel necessarily as qualified to answer this one as most. Does anybody have secrets that they use that they want to share? I mean, otherwise I'll say what some other people have told me. Yeah. Noise canceling headphones. Noise canceling headphones helps. Headphones too, because it lets other people know not to bother you. The bigger the headphones, the less likely someone is to come bother you. That's fantastic <laughs> advice. I don't even turn on music. I just have the headphones. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even need anything in them. Yeah, the problem with the headphones is that like music distracts me. Yeah. Yeah. So that I find that I can't do that. So I'll put on just the headphones. Several people that wear headphones and don't listen to anything in them. That's fantastic. Yeah. No, what, I, what I find with headphones, I don't think anybody else found this too, is that it, even though it should be a visual indicator and I'm like staring at my screen trying to like work on something, somebody comes up and I can see them like they start talking and like, oh, I guess you want to talk. <laughs> yeah. I, I do. It, it is a little frustrating when people don't um, sort of observe the unspoken headphone rule, right? Which is. Don't bother me. Um, other things that I've heard people suggest is stepping away for coffee at the coffee pot or something like that. Um, get a half a cup of coffee instead of a full one so that you run out and have to do that more often. Um, anything that you can do to sort of step away when you feel like you need it. And unfortunately, every office is going to be a little bit different, some more accepting to that than others, um, but yeah, it seems like headphones is by and large the go-to solution for people for that. Anything else? We still have a few minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just a quick question. Maybe if you can talk a little bit about your approach to balancing your um, introversion tendencies with being a leader, mm. um, because there's, there's times where you have to be on and be the guy that people are looking at you for yeah, I mean, I definitely think that, um, especially for a long time, there was a stigma that introverts couldn't really be leaders. Um, I actually know many extremely strong leaders that are introverts, and I think that introverts can be very good, but you're right, um, it often requires... Um, a bit more contact. You can't always just go away and say, I'm recharging, I'm unavailable. If you have people that need you in order to, you know, move on to the next thing. Um, so for me, there's a, there's a few specific things that I do. The biggest is trying to make sure that I am in the right place personally as far as, um, not having run out of energy. I don't go back to um, lead a team meeting the evening after a conference like this or something like that, or even the day after. Um, I know that I have to recharge. I don't try to step in and lead things or, or run things when I know that I'm already on, you know, low or on, on E. Um, but other than that, generally speaking, I just am just like every other leader. Like I let the people can come in and talk to me and yeah, maybe it throws me off for a little bit and maybe it causes a little stimulation that I wasn't expecting. But that just means that I, you know, maybe have to take an extra break and recover if, if it was really that bad. Um, 
it doesn't make me incapable of making decisions, even quick ones. Um, it, it doesn't make me uh, incapable of seeing the bigger picture or planning things out or understanding what the other people in my team need to do. All these things that a leader does, all the things that I think make a quality leader, like introversion doesn't really get in the way of any of them. Yeah. I work in an environment where um, bosses and managers or superiors above me are uh, extremely extroverted, mm -hmm. and I get the sense all the time that they're judging me or, or that they feel that being introverted is a weakness, and they're always like, you need to become more like me um, in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. How do you, any, any ideas on how to kind of combat that stigma or that? Scenario. Yeah, that is a tough one because by and large, I feel like from when I was really sort of struggling with it and making this change about like 10 years ago to now, things have generally gotten better. I feel like that stigma is a, a little bit less, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist now. Um, and I do think that most people tend to think that in order to succeed and 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 do well, you should be like me. And so when you have extroverted leaders, they sort of assume that you need to be extroverted like them to move forward. Um, and I've definitely faced that a lot, but I'm not totally sure that there's a tried and true method for helping them understand. Um, I do think that some things that have worked for me is stepping forward as a leader in situations um, and letting them see that, even if you're not being loud and boisterous, if you are leading and, and taking that in situations where you can, they start to see you as a leader rather than as a, an introvert. Um, the other is, I, I'm a very open person, so I, uh, I don't have a problem just going to someone and saying, hey, look, it seems like you feel like I need to be extroverted, but I think that I can lead exactly like I am. Give me a chance. Um, that doesn't always work, but that is definitely my, I'm very much a direct approach kind of person. Um, anybody else have suggestions, though? We have a room full of people, so, no, it's a tough problem for everybody, huh? Fantastic. <laughs> I do kind yeah. of make a, like a rule if, if I'm, like I'm getting like an email or if someone needs something, I just get it like right on that and just get that out of the way like immediately. Mm -hmm. get back to my stuff. So that's something I kind of do. I kind of make it like a, like this is my, like it, still in meetings and stuff, I still have to remind myself like, oh, I'm here in the meeting. I actually have to talk to people. But if it's if it's something like um, someone needing help with something, I just make it like a, it's like my duty to get right, right on it and stuff. Yeah, and I do think that, like, speaking about being in a meeting, for example, I do think that because we tend to be um, better listeners and not necessarily prefer to speak up all the time, um, I do have to try to be aware of the times when I need to speak up, the times when it's actually a really beneficial thing for me to say or do a thing. Um, I feel like some extroverts have to remind themselves that there are times when they need to not do that and be quiet for a little bit. Um, but we're both, we both have those things. And just as much as we wish they would just be quiet for a little bit, we need to also be aware that there are times when we have extremely useful information, things that we should be sharing that would maybe help people see us as leaders um, that we need to speak up and share. And yes, it's going to take energy, but start being aware of that. Maybe it means that you need to take a quick break just before that meeting so that you know that you have the energy going into it to speak up. Yeah? Um, I, I've seen people who, they, they get that feedback that if you want to be seen, you need to speak up, speak up in every meeting. And because it starts to be something that people, oh my God, speak up, they say the dumbest stuff. So <laughs> it's important to... Um, be careful with that advice, um, but it's, it's like you were saying, like if you can just draw a circle around, these are the things I know that nobody else around here knows, 
and these are the concerns, and these are my responsibilities, and just kind of have them front you. And when something touches that, make sure that you do speak up. And you're, you know. so, so basically, speak up when it's useful to speak up. Don't speak up for the sake of speaking up. Like that's that's fantastic advice. Yeah. in the back first. and sort of how all that worked definitely helped me also understand extroverts and how they work, which uh, I think has made me better at interacting with everyone, other people that are like me as well as other people that are not, for sure. Yeah. So you've talked a little bit about like introverts dealing with extroverts and our field is why introverts they deal with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do introverts best deal with other introverts? You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. written communication. Um, you know, honestly, there is something to uh, using a thing that is comfortable for both people. You know, uh, need, if you if it's absolute if it's not absolutely necessary to meet in person, and both of you prefer to communicate. Written, doing that makes a lot of sense because also the back and forth form of email causes each person in turn to do their thing rather than constantly waiting, hoping the other person will speak up and do a thing. Um, but when it is necessary to be in person, you know, sometimes it's it's as simple as saying, "Hey, you know, I." We're both introverted. We both prefer to kind of keep to ourselves, but we like what do you think about this? Prompt them, then they can prompt you. I mean, I feel like as an introvert, we can just go, what would what would make it easier for me? And then just try to do that for them, you know? I, I guess that's the best I, can, best I can offer there. Anyone else? I think we're right about at, oh, we are. We're past time, so thank you all. I will be around, so...